So Derek is the um, an anomaly. He is a, lob a lobbyist and a pastor. He is an active registered lobbyist currently serving as chief operating officer for Johnson and Blanton LLC. He has nearly 25 years of experience in state government and politics. Prior to his current role, he was a director of legislative affairs for the executive office of Governor Rick Scott. In this capacity, he was responsible for advocating and securing passage of the governor's le legislative priorities. He is the founding pastor of Bible-based church in Tallahassee, Florida, which launched in 2010. He is also married to his college sweetheart, and they are blessed to have two children. He received his formal education at the Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University. Here he earned his BA in political science and religion in 2000. Derek, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Hope you all are doing well. Let me first start out by apologizing to everyone. It was my intention to be on camera. Um, I live in Tallahassee. I'm stuck in the halls of the Capitol because we're under a tornado warning. And so we've been advised not to leave the Capitol. And so that's why I'm not on camera. Um, but I hope you will excuse me in that regard. But thank you once again for letting me be a part of it. Thank you, Gary, uh, for the invitation to join on. So I want to share with you all just a legislative update um, on where things are. I did present a um, particular a PowerPoint presentation. If you all wouldn't mind sharing that for me, I would appreciate it. And I wanted to be able to do the PowerPoint to kind of just start back really in November when the election first began and the results from the election um, and go from there up to where we are now and what we anticipate seeing during the legislative session. Um, and as that's getting prepared, let me share with you that that session um, we'll begin on Tuesday, March the 7th, and we'll conclude on Friday, May the 5th. Again, it will start Tuesday, March the 7th, and conclude Friday, May the 5th. And so that's 60 consecutive days. Um, we are currently in our last committee week of this, of, of the month of January. So there was one committee week in December, which actually was a special session for property insurance. We've had two special, we had two, had two committee weeks as well back to back last week and this week and then we'll have next week off and then we'll have three consecutive committee weeks in february the week of the 6th week of the 13th and the week of the 20th then i'll take that last week of february off and then they will begin session again on tuesday march the 7th and so thank you for bringing up the powerpoint i want to walk you through a few slides i'm not going to um bore you with, with a lot of slides i just want to share with you some graphics and so if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide i would appreciate it There we go. And so this, this slide here, I want to open up by showing you from the Florida Senate's perspective in 2020, really so before November the 8th election, this is where you saw the makeup between Republicans and Democrats. Um, I've been doing this for 22 years, going on 23 sessions, and Republicans have been in charge of the House and the Senate and the governor's office the entirety of my career. Prior to the election, Republicans had 24 um seats there are 40 total seats of senators the republicans had 24 of the 40 leaving the remaining 16 to the democrats and again this is before the november the 8th election go to the next slide please this slide here shows you the result thank you it shows you the result after the election so what you see is the republicans actually gained more seats which you see the Republicans actually gain more seats. So now this, the Republicans in the Senate have a super majority. Um, and, and that's important when it relates to bills being passed, when it relates to budget allocations and things being funded. Um, they now, the Democrats who are now in the super minority, they, they no longer have the votes to, to be able to stop a bill from being heard, to be able to um, you know protest anything, raise a point of order, et cetera, et cetera. So now the Republicans have 28 of the 40 seats in the Senate, leaving Democrats with 12. Again, that's important when you look at it from a math standpoint. So the, so the Republicans actually gained more seats. And because of redistricting, the maps were redrawn and seats were redrawn. And so there were seats that two years ago that were um, probably very Democrat or very Republican have now either changed become even more that way or now blended. But what you see here is the Senate now has, Republicans now have 28 of the 40 seats. 
That's important. Next slide, please. This slide here shows you in, in 2020 the, the breakdown between the, the Republicans and Democrats in the House. There are 120 seats in the House. And before the election, um, the Republicans had 78 of the 120 seats in the House. To have a supermajority, you would need 80 seats. But they had 78 and 42 for the Democrats. Next slide, please. Now, if you look at this slide, what you see is similar to what you saw in the Senate. The Republicans um, gained more seats and Democrats lost more seats. So I mentioned earlier, you would need 80 seats in the House to have supermajority. If you see here, the Republicans actually um, had a plus seven. They netted plus seven seats. They had 78 going into the election. They end up coming out with 85. And so the House also has supermajority as well. Same thing here. And so now what this means is, is the Republicans fully control both House and Senate. Um, every committee is will be dominated by um, Republicans. But also what that means, again, as I mentioned earlier, is that the Democrats who are in the minority will not have the votes to stop any bill from being heard, any bill from passing. Um, they won't have the votes to demand rules be read or raise a point of order or things of that nature. And so you're looking here, the last time both chambers had a supermajority was when Governor Scott won. Governor Scott won office in, in 2010, was sworn in in 2011. His first two sessions, um, the Republicans set supermajority and in that immediate next election, two years later, they lost supermajority but maintained the majority. So I wanted you to see um, the breakdown of, of where both chambers are now, where both the Republicans in the House and Senate have a supermajority. Next slide, please. So this slide here really is just showing you who the presiding officers are. So right now, Kathleen Pasadomo is the Senate president and Paul Renner is the House Speaker. They began um, their, their leadership on November 22nd when they became presiding officers and they'll do that for two years. And so they'll be Speaker and Senate president until November of 2024. Kathleen Pasadomo is the third um, woman Senate president in the history of Florida. And so she, um, we had Gwen Margolis years ago, and we had Tony Jennings out of Orlando, who had two consecutive terms as Senate president, and then Kathleen Pasadomo. She's out of Naples, Florida, and then Paul Renner is out of Palm Coast, Florida. And so, again, these are the two presiding officers. They lead their respective chambers, and as you saw the numbers, they lead a very, a very large majority chamber as well. Next slide, please. Here, I kind of already aforementioned that session is 60 days. Many of you will know this. I don't want to insult your intelligence, but in Florida, we do 60 consecutive days. So that includes your weekends. Um, our legislature is deemed to be a part-time bicameral legislature, simply meaning that we have a House and a Senate and a bill has to move in both chambers in order for it to really um, be, be able to be passed and go to the governor. And so since session begins March the 7th, and we'll conclude May the 5th. And during that time, again, you'll have a lot of bills that pass. If you know here in Florida, we typically on average have about 32 to 3,500 bills get filed. Last year, we had a little over 3,300 bills get filed. About 320 or so actually made it to the governor. Um, so think about that, about 10% of the bills that actually get filed make it to the finish line, which is the governor's office for him to react to. So it kind of really shows you um, how things really are working here in Tallahassee. Next slide, please. Thank you. So here, just I wanted to point this out to you. I mentioned this earlier about committee weeks. We're one of the very few states that actually does committee weeks and session. Most states will do 90 days, et cetera, et cetera, their session. We do 60 consecutive days, but we do um, typically six committee weeks. This year, we're actually doing seven. Again, we mentioned, we had mentioned one in December, we've had three in January and we'll have three in February. Normally we don't, we only have two in January, um, but we'll have seven this go around. So this is really allowing them to file bills, introduce bills, move bills along, position bills for session in that regard. So I want you to see that as well, that they've already begun their work on presentations from agencies, on, um, um, on the hearing bills that have been filed by members and more bills will be filed. So that's important. And again, the dates I mentioned to you for the session begins. Next slide, please. This is here, just another breakdown. It's, it's kind of describing more about the difference between the Senate and the House chamber, their numbers, 40 in the Senate, 
120 in the house. The one thing I do want to mention, because it was raised earlier by Gary regarding Barbara, Barbara Palmer um, having resigned uh, at APD, um, her, her successor has not been publicly made known who that is. Um, and so as of right now, there, there is no one named to succeed her. But I bring it up also because the Florida Senate is the chamber that's in charge of, of confirmation process. So when the governor makes, a point, makes the appointment, um, whomever he or she is, they'll have to go through Senate confirmation. They'll have to go through two to three committees of reference given to them and then ultimately have to um, be voted on by the full Senate, which is the, which, which is the 40 members. They'll have to be voted on by those members to be confirmed into that office. And so although the governor makes the appointment, the Senate still has to confirm them for that seat. And that's important to know because it's, it's the governor, they, they typically will, will make sure his confirmation, his appointments get through. But it's important for you to know that, that the Senate has the authority when it comes to the, to the appointments as well. Next slide. Thank you. I wanted to have this slide in here, just kind of show you statewide. So along with the Republicans, have super majority in the House and the Senate. They also have, um, Republicans also have the governor's mansion and the three cabinet offices. So our attorney general won her reelection, our chief financial officer, Jimmy Petronas, he won his reelection. And then Wilton Simpson, who is the former Senate president, he just won his election. He ran, um, that, that's the seat that Commissioner Nikki Free was in, and she re basically resigned her seat. Not really resigned, she decided to run for re-election so that she can run for governor. Um, so that seat became open. And so now all of the statewide offices in Florida are ran by the Republicans, including our two U.S. Senate seats as well. And so I just wanted you to see who was who makes up the, the, the governor and the cabinet um, and these members. Next slide, please. This here is just a slide just showing you really the districts in the, in the delegation breakdown. Um, I've already spoken to this about 40 senators, 120 House members. There are 67 delegations, which each, each county has its own delegation. So this is really showing you that on the map. You wouldn't mind going to the next slide, please. And so I, I inserted this in here um, because I've been doing this for 22 years. And over my 22 years, the need for a lobbyist has grown the more than it was when I first entered the profession. When I first entered, I was public sector. I worked for state agencies. And there's always been lobbyists in the process, but the need for a lobbyist has grown the more. So I wanted to kind of just put a slide in to kind of speak to uh, why do you hire or need a lobbyist? And the way our process is now, because um, of, of the number breakdown, things of that nature, the lobbyist in, really has four responsibilities or four reasons why you would need it. Number one is uh, that lobbyist can do what you or your organization cannot do, right? And so there, there comes a point where you may hit an impasse or strategic inflection point and you just need help um, going a little bit further. A lobbyist helps in that role. A lobbyist can help, um, they have the experience necessary to find the best solutions. You know, sometimes it's not about what you know, but who you know, right? And lobbyists usually have very influential relationships where they can help open doors and or close doors that will help um, your, your industry and your profession. And so, they play a role in that regard. The lobbyist also has access to decision makers, whether that be the governor's office, the House or Senate. Um, and so that's important. Again, as I aforementioned, sometimes you want to build to advance and sometimes you want to build not to advance. And the lobbyist plays a critical role in preventing from being built from moving or having helping bills move along. And then, and then the lobbyist also has the essential knowledge, um, knowledge of the legislative process and the executive process. And, you know, as a lobbyist myself, I'm lobbying not only the House and the Senate, I'm also lobbying the governor's office um, and the governor's agencies. And so I think that's important as well. And so, you know, lobbyists aren't always needed, but 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 as the, as as this profession and as the process is working out, becoming more and more necessary and needed. Let me also share two more things and then I'll open up for questions. Gary mentioned about Barbara Palmer. Also, I think it's important to mention that Simone, Secretary Simone Mosteller from ACA, she she resigned. Um, effective December 30th. And that's important. So Florida several years ago passed a law that if you are an elected official or a state agency head, um, come December 31st, you will now have a six-year lobbying ban placed upon you. So what that means is, is if you are agency head today as we're talking, once you resign that position, if you try to decide to go private sector, you now have to wait six years before you can actually lobby in the state of Florida. 
it, it was normally a two year lobbying ban for anyone who's registered as a lobbyist in government. You had to, you had to sit out for two years. Now, if you are an agency head, Secretary Masso is a good example of that, or you are an elected official, house member, senator, city or county commissioner, a mayor, governor, et cetera, et cetera, you now have a six year lobbying ban placed upon you. That ban is why you, we saw some agency heads step down from their situation. Secretary Mosteller chose to retire from, from state government work. And so we don't know what she's gonna do next, it hasn't been announced yet, but that's important because her chief of staff um, has been named as the interim secretary of ACA. The governor made that known so he is now the interim secretary of ACA. Rumor has it that um, in the next 30 days or so, they'll probably more likely make him the permanent secretary, but he is the interim secretary. So he was chief of staff of ACA, and then he became the chief of staff uh, for about maybe maybe two months or so. And now he's the interim secretary and high likelihood is that he'll be named as secretary of ACA over the next 30 days in that regard. So I wanna make sure that's known as well, but I know um, that there's work done at ACA as well. And then lastly, um, I'm also tracking bills that I think are, are, are of interest. Bills are still being filed. And so not a lot of movement thus far as well as legislation. Um, typically we see way more bills filed than we've seen thus far in the process. Some of that has to do with the fact that there's so many um, young members, meaning freshman members, they're still learning how to really get their bills filed. They will see a, a major dumping of bills shortly. So there are of the 120 legislators, the 120 legislators, about 81 of them are freshmen or sophomore members. So think about that now. Of the 120 legislators, 120 House members, I'm sorry, 81 of them are freshmen, meaning first time legislators, or they're sophomore, meaning they just started their second term here. So you can kind of sense the youth of, of the process in Tallahassee. And as a result, we're seeing the slow pace of legislation being filed. And so I'm tracking legislation as it relates to um, all things Medicaid, as it relates to any and everything that's of importance to our industry, insurance, um, and things of that nature. And so I'll be keeping Gary abreast as we see things that are that are going on here in Tallahassee that are that are that are critical in that regard. Once we know more about APD leadership, we'll make sure we get that word out as well. Uh, a lot is happening here. A lot will be happening here as well, especially with the cloud over what the, what the governor's going to do about presidential running. That will make play a make make a make, play a major role here in Tallahassee as well as relates to legislation and movement. Um, and so a lot is going on. And so I'll stop there. I know there's more to have to be discussed on the agenda, and I'll open it up for any questions you all may have. And thank you once again for letting me call in, not be on camera, but also be able to present. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, um, Derek. We really appreciate you as well. So uh, we do have a couple questions for you. Um, our first one, who is in Tallahassee that's currently championing for changes regarding um, our support coordinators and um, providers? So is, that, is that a question regarding legislators or, mm -hmm. or industry? Or legislators, okay, yeah. legislators. So yeah. Yeah, so you, you have, um, that's a really good question because we lost a lot of, um, of experienced legislators. And so you have members like uh, Representative Jenna Parsons Malik, uh, Malika, Malika um, who's a returning member. She's a sophomore member. Um, she has been very supportive of industry. She's, um, she's in the major majority party. Um, she is actually out of Fort Myers. Again, her name is Jenna Parsons um, Malika. She's a member that I, that that is worth getting to know again out of the Fort Myers area. You have Representative Tracy Coster. She's out of Tampa. Um, been very very supportive of industry. And in the House again, there's a lot of new members, and so you, we we lose some um, in that regard. Representative Sam Garrison out of the Clay County area. Been very supportive of industry. He's actually the Healthcare Appropriations Chair, so he's in charge of all the budget for healthcare. He's also slated to become House Speaker in four years. Um, so he's very important. I would mention to you, Representative Alex Rizzo. Uh, Rizzo's out of Miami-Dade County. He's um, a sophomore member, had, had a really two good years, his first two years up here. Um, and then and then you have several on the Senate side um, that, as it came from the House, um, people like Colleen Burton, Representative Senator, now Senator Colleen Burton is someone, she's from Lakeland, Florida. She um, is a chair of health policy. She's been um, in healthcare majority of her career up here, but she's been 
um, pretty supportive. And so she's definitely um, worthy of getting to know and spending time with. Senator Gail Harrell um, has been really good. She's been in healthcare for a long time, very, very familiar with our industry. She's the healthcare appropriations chair. So again, she's in charge of money. I would argue that um, the Senate president, Kathleen Pasadomo out of Naples, Florida, um, has really been a champion as well. Uh, and then another member I would I would put on everyone's radar um, that I that I think is important to get to know is Senator Jennifer Bradley out of Clay County. Although she is chairing criminal justice appropriation, um, she she her time up here she's been very supportive of the industry as well. And there are other members. I don't want to um, slide anyone on the House side. It's a little bit more challenging, mainly because you just have so much youth um, up here, and so some of them really haven't um, really had a chance to really show and display. Um, where they want to be as far as champions. So that, that'll be uncovered as session progresses. It's a great question. Thank you, Derek. That was a great answer. And I'm, I'm sure we'll be able to get a list from you as well. Yes. Um, so Absolutely. we can share that with our um, our members. Um, one of the, the, the repeated questions we've received um, is in reference to uh, rate increases for waiver support coordinators and whether we can add that to our um, legislative priorities for 2023. So this, that might be a more of an Empower Florida um, broad question, but um, that is something that some of our waiver support coordinators are wondering at this time. So I, I definitely think that's a, a, an Empower Florida question. Um, I will tell you that that if that is going to become a, one of the priorities, it would be good to, to formulate that um, because things are moving pretty fast. Um, but I would I would defer answering that one to to more experience. Yep, I totally um, agree, and I, I believe that is part of the plan. And um, Gary will probably speak to this a little okay. bit more um, as far That's as cool. the the putting together the list of, of legislative issues for this year, but that, you know, that's part of the reason why Empower Florida exists um, to be able to advocate for um, this community. So um, for anybody that does have any um, suggestions, um, we'll be putting um, an option for you to include that in the survey when we send that out um, after today's webinar. Okay. So I don't believe we have any other um, questions that you need to address specifically, um, Derek, um, a lot of them are, are more focused on um, just kind of industry-wide initiatives and whatnot, but um, did Understood. you have anything else that you wanted to to say or share before we... Well, what I'll do is, is lastly, I will get to Gary a list of, again, um, this PowerPoint, you guys have the PowerPoint, but I'll get a listing of the House and Senate member breakdown so you can see who they are, what the areas that they are, they are located in in Florida, in case you want to meet with anybody in there back in their local their local areas. I'll get that to you all as well. But thank you all so very much. I appreciate it. Well, we appreciate you. Thank you so much, Derek, for joining us. And please stay safe up there in Tallahassee. Um, we hope that nothing actually emerges from this tornado, but please stay safe. Thank you. All right. So we are going to continue with our um presentations and we've got